Hello everyone, uh, very good evening to all of you. Um, hope uh, you'll bear with me for the delay, you know, I have to attend for an urgent meeting. Right, you know, Mondays. Right, so my name is uh, Dilshad Jifri and I'm from uh, Premier Partners Institute of Management, right? And I'll be conducting uh, the revision session for advanced performance management. Um, so, as we go on, if you have any questions, uh, you can always let me know and we would clear it and move forward. So in the next uh, couple of uh, revision sessions, what I'm planning to do is, I'm planning to take you through a uh, few areas in the syllabus which are critical. And then uh, I'm going to do um, more and more questions, right? Um, so that you can understand how in the exam, that you need to write the answers. If you look at uh, APM, I mean, the pass rate is quite low. I think it's around uh, 35, sometimes a little less than that, you know, definitely, you know, around 30, 30 35 or less, right? But uh, I maintain a pass rate of, uh, you know, more than 60%, uh, mainly because of uh, the exam technique. 
and uh, the approach that I teach my students to you know uh, go through and practice, right? So, but I hope uh, although this is a short revision, that it helps you to you know uh, polish up your skills and then be ready um, in a month's time to face the exam, right? So you strongly follow the guidelines that I give you. And on the last session, I'll tell you uh, certain you know, key exam uh, techniques that you need to follow on the day of the exam, right? Um, so if you look at the syllabus, uh, when it comes to APM, we have, uh, we used to have four areas, but now there are six. So that is strategic planning and control, then performance management, uh, information systems, and developments in technology. And then uh, strategic performance measurement, where you have the critical success factors, mission KPIs, you know. Then performance evaluation, where you have all your budgets and then uh, variance, grant surprising, divisional performance appraisal. Then professional skills. Now, this is something new. Uh, if you are someone who is repeating the exam, right? Now, normally, when it comes to APM examination, right? Um, there are a lot of students who are repeaters, okay? I mean, twice, thrice, sometimes, you know, they do it four times, right? And then only they fail, right? They pass the exam. So if you are coming from, let's say, an old batch, right? Before the syllabus change or whatever, uh, this is a new topic for you, professional skills. And students who have done their SBL examination, they, they will be very much familiar with this uh, professional skills. But I will also teach you what it is here, right, and how to tackle that as well. And then uh, employability and technology skills. So that is also something that you need to be aware of, right? And then uh, if you look at your exam format, right, there are two sections. Section A, a compulsory uh, question with sub, uh, you know, questions of course for 50 marks. And then uh, two compulsory questions in section B, worth 25 marks each, right? Earlier, there were options. It's no longer available. Now you have to do all three questions, right? You must do the 50 and then you must do the other 225 mark questions. And you know, as with any other exam, the past mark is 50, right? And you get uh, three hours of uh, you know time with another 15 minutes for all your panicking and you know going blackout and reading and all that. Okay, so take it as 180, 180 minutes, right? And if you look at uh, this part, technical syllabus sections A, B, and uh, C are examinable in section A. I mean, you don't have to uh, follow that. You just be ready for any questions anywhere because all three are compulsory, right? Um, whatever that is there on the paper, you need to be able to answer, right? That's the uh, confidence level. That's the preparation that you must have, right? Anything from uh, APM, I'm, I'm ready to answer, okay? Now here, uh, there will be 10 professional marks available in section A and five professional marks available in section B. So altogether, 15 marks available uh, for professional uh, skills, right? Questions will be based around scenario and there will be a mixture of written requirements and computational requirements. Now, if you ask me, you will always want to know what is the calculation percentage, right? Normally, uh, it's about, I would say, 30 to 70. Between that or 35 or 65, right? I mean, more towards theory and uh, around 30 to 35% towards calculations, right? That's how you know your um, marks for numbers or computations are given. All right. <clears throat> right, so like I said, um, I will be teaching you certain areas like, uh, you know, fully like, let's say, trans surprising, right? Um, other areas I'll be quickly running through, and uh, I might I will uh, touch a lot on questions, right? So that you will know how exactly you should answer, right? And then how much to write 
that's that's a major question in your head, isn't it? To get a 10 mark question, I mean, to, to get an answer a 10 mark question and to get the maximum marks, how much should I write? Or to be more precise, you might even want to know how many lines should I write? So those are things that I will, you know, tell you how exactly you need to tackle, right? Um, an important thing, as you know, now all exams are computer based. Just ensure that you have a minimum of 25 words per minute. Your typing speed should be a minimum of 25 words per minute, right? It is at that speed. Uh, you could, you know, comfortably tackle these papers, right? And as much as possible, um, use, you know, your computer, right? To type answers, do the calculation, right? Um, because in the exam, we're not going to write anymore. So how efficiently you write in a book is, is no longer relevant, right? But what matters is how efficiently you type your answer, right? The structure, um, your, your style of writing. Uh, can you tell me, uh, spellings and grammar, do they matter in the exam? What do you think? Spellings and grammar, do they matter in the exam? To a certain extent. To a certain extent. Can you make uh, spelling mistakes? I mean, will the examiner reduce marks? What do you think? I think no. No, yes, you're right. They don't uh, reduce marks, right? But that doesn't mean uh, it can be like a nursery kids, you know, um, <laughs> paper, right? Because the, the point is, this is a professional level paper, advanced performance management. You are expected to, you know, think like a manager or, you know, at a high level. So then work at that level is also what? Quality work, not just, you know, a shoddy job, right? So but don't worry. You don't have to, you know, delete, delete and correct your, uh, you know, answers. But ensure uh, your grammar is in place and then uh, the spellings are in place. And then you have the speed, most important, uh, the speed. A lot of students, I mean, I, I mean, you know, you come back and tell you did not have enough time. So one of the main reasons for not having enough time is that either you know, earlier it was the speed of writing, but now it is speed of typing. Okay. We should be able to type at the speed at which we think. I know it's tough because we think very fast, right? So the, the flow should be there. The coordination between your mind and the uh, hand and the fingers, right? It should, you know, quickly flow. As you see the question, you should know, you know, A, B, C, D, this is what I need to put down and in a nice structure, okay? Right. Now, a small question for you. Should you uh, know the theory in APM? Now we have, you know, mainly uh, four different, four, four areas, right? A, B, C, D. Do you know the theoretical aspects properly? For example, uh, balance scorecard. What is balance scorecard? Advantages of balance scorecard, disadvantages of balance scorecard. Should you should you know it in detail? What do you think? Um, I think we should know uh, what are the areas it covers in general and link it to the scenario and elaborate from there. Oh, very good, right? Um, one, more, one more step. You should know it 110%. Okay, you should know it 110%. Now, if someone comes and tells you for APM theoretical knowledge is not needed, no, <laughs> right? That is absolutely wrong. You need to have absolute clarity on the concepts, the theory that uh, the syllabus has, and you need to remember everything. I'll tell you how it matters. I am not telling you to buy heart. Okay, I'm not telling you to buy heart, but you should remember. For example, if Balance Scorecard has five advantages, you should know those five advantages. If it has another six disadvantages, you should know what those six disadvantages are. Only then you can tackle the exam. 
only then you can tackle the exam. I will do questions and show you how it matters. So you need to have number one, I mean, very thorough idea about the theories. Conceptual clarity should be there, right? Number two, you should know how to apply it to a particular scenario, how to apply it to a particular scenario. I'll give you a very simple, uh, you know, a kiddish example. Okay, right? Um, let's say you do, a, you know, uh, you go for a cookery class. So you learn to make, um, let's say, a soup, right? So what do they do? They, they'll tell you the ingredients and they'll tell you how to mix at what temperature, right? At what to add at different stages and then who can, you know, um, serve, isn't it? Now you come home and uh, let's say your grandmother, she is not well, and that's this particular spice which is there in the recipe, which is not good for her. Now, will you add that? You can't, isn't it? That's what you call application. You know how to make a soup, but there's this particular ingredient which is not good for your grandmother. And now you need to avoid that. So the knowledge of that ingredient being there in the recipe is important. For only then you, you know uh, to avoid it. Let's say, you know, ingredient A. So ingredient A is not good for your grandma. If you don't know that there is something called as an ingredient A and that it is there in the recipe, then problem. You will add it there and then, you know, your grandmother will suffer. Right? It's, it's a very simple example. So similarly, if I tell you, right, what are the generic rules of transfer pricing? Uh, you should know A, B, C, D. Only then you can do a transfer pricing question. Right? What are the practical elements of transfer pricing? Uh, you should know all of that. What is dual pricing? What is two-part tariff? Because all of that, that theory is what will be tested in the exam. Not, I mean, not about repeating as it is, but for you to apply. So like I said, I will be doing a lot of questions and I'll tell you how each of these theory with theories and models and techniques and calculations will be tested in the exam. Okay. And uh, one last thing before I get into the you know uh, topic. APM, unlike SBR or any other exam, needs a lot of logical thinking. If you look at F2, F5, right, it's all a lot of logical thinking. $10 for one unit, it should be $20 for two units. No one need to tell you that, isn't it? $10 for one unit, $20 for two units, $100 for 10 units. Now that automatically, your brain should work. Performance is like that, right? Last ball, you need six runs. Last ball, you need six runs. Do you send Virat Kohli or do you send, you know, a bowler to hit? Simple as that, right? So it's it's a lot about logic, you know, and then knowing where to apply your theory, right? So we need to be a little bit more smarter than, you know, trying to apply standards and, you know, other techniques here. Okay, so that is why I told you, theoretical knowledge is important, your speed is important, and then your application, that's very important. All right. All right, before I move on, any questions you have? Anything that you would like to clarify before I start so that I can, you know, bring it to my lectures in future? Any questions? No. Right, good. As we go on, if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. I'm more than willing to, you know, uh, help you with that. And have you guys uh, gone through the theory practical part? Have you brushed up the theory? Are you very confident with the theory? By now, you should have cleared everything, huh? 
Are you confident with your critical areas? I hope so. These are the topics we have. Strategic management accounting, then ESG, uh, budgets, business structure and performance management, then IS and IT, uh, then performance report management, a very uh, famous, frequent uh, area that is tested in the exam, then HR aspects, human resource, then financial performance measures in the private sector. So whenever you have calculations, uh, chapter eight and nine, divisional performance and transfer pricing, you know, they, they come into the picture. Then uh, performance management in uh, not-for-profit organization, right, NFPs. Then uh, non-financial performance indicators. That is where all your balance scorecard and, you know, everything comes in. Then quality. And of course, finally, professional skills and employability and technology skills. Right, so let me, uh, now we have very limited time, two weeks and about, you know, 12 hours. So let me quickly take you through as much as possible. Can you quickly tell me what is uh, management accounting is? Just type one line, what is management accounting? Any idea? What is management accounting? Yeah, good. Provision of information for decision making. And when you say strategic management accounting, now normally management accounting is providing internal information to the senior management board of directors for decision making. So management accountant will provide information for them to make decision. So if you give the wrong information, they'll make the wrong decision. So it's a very critical role. That is why we learn so much in order that we give them the right direction, right, right information. And when you say strategic management accounting, now you are focusing on internal information as well as external information. You're focusing on financial information as well as non-financial information. You're focusing on quantitative information as well as qualitative information. You're focusing on pestle information. So here, the moment you bring in the word strategy, the big picture comes into play. So now the you know scope, the role is quite big, right? Now, uh, let me tell you something. Now this is chapter one, now introduction to strategic management accounting, and. The, in, if you take any textbook, you know, uh, any, um, you know, note, you will have this uh, area called learning outcomes. What is this? If you read this, can you guys quickly tell me? This learning outcomes we go through. Is it important? I didn't hear it properly. Uh, now, I hope you can see my screen. Can you? Yes, yes, can. Right. Now, this learning outcomes, is this important for us? Should we read? Yes. What is it trying to tell us? What is uh, learning outcome trying to tell us? Any idea? Have you ever thought about it? Learning outcomes. What is it trying to tell us? The, the end result we are looking at. End result, okay. From this particular uh, topic or subject, where we are going to uh, end at. Okay, I'll, I'll make it very simple for you. 
Now here, there are actually more, but here, let now here there are three, six, seven blood points. No, actually there's more huh, here, but I'll just show you this seven. Now, for example, this says, by the end of the session, you should be able to explain the role of strategic performance management in strategic planning and control. Now, these are the questions that can come in your exam. If you can answer these, ah, then you can answer any questions from this chapter. You understand, right? So be ready to answer this. Okay, be ready to answer this. So you learn a chapter, then you come back and see, can I explain the role of strategic performance management? Can I discuss the role of performance management? Can I compare planning and control? You understand? These are the things that will be tested in the exam. Right? If you can tackle these, you can pretty much tackle any questions in the exam. Of course, not the calculation one. Calculations will be, once will be uh, very different and it will be a new question every time you do a question. Right? I mean, in APM, when it comes to calculations, you can't look at one and do another. Okay. In APM, when it comes to calculations, you can't do one question and then take that as an example and do another. Because every time it's a brand new question with totally different numbers. Okay. So that's what I told you initially logic becomes critical, right? So remember, learning outcomes are very important. Okay, <clears throat> right. So in this particular chapter, look at the amount of areas we need to look at. Planning and control, role of performance measures in uh, taking towards objective set, strategic objectives, critical success factors, and KPIs. All three are always linked. Then uh, benchmarking performance. And models used in performance management, you need to know all these models, what best, Pyphosis, uh, BCG matrix, and so on. then Porter's generic strategy, right? Remember I asked you, do you know the theory? Do you know the advantages, disadvantages? Yes, you need to have absolute clarity, right? Then introduction to risk and uncertainty. Uh, expected value, maximax, maximum, minimax, and uh, risk capital. Now, these are things that you learn in uh, F2 and F5. Same theory, same. But the way you apply in APM is very different. Right? It's more at an advanced level. How you, you know, tackle the questions. All right. Now, to show you how APM examiner tests your knowledge, and how the questions are asked, I will teach you a small area and then do a question, right? So that you understand how serious it is, okay? I don't want to say that, you know, this is very easy and then, you know, uh, give you lullabies. No, right? I want to tell you the reality, okay? How, how you should get involved and how seriously you should learn this, okay? Um, right, now let's look at this uh, area. Strategic objectives critical success factors, <clears throat> and um, performance indicators. Right. So objectives. Now, there are four words, vision, mission, goals and objectives. If you want me to give you the exact meanings, vision means very long term, five years, 10 years, 15 years, that is vision, very vague, right? Uh, it's there in the sky. Mission, clouds. Okay, next, within the next five years, next uh, one, two years, what do we achieve? Goals, what do you achieve in your market? Your revenue targets for the year. Objective, what do I do in the factory flow? That is objective, right? Very day-to-day, short-term targets. But we won't go into that level of, uh, you know, separation. We'll use this interchangeably, right? Normally, 
the term we use is mission. Okay, mission is what the company wants to achieve. So mission will be translated into a set of smart strategic objectives. Achievement of these objectives should ultimately help the organization to achieve its mission. So basically, you know, your mission should be smart. That is, it should be specific. It should relate to a specific area, you know. Measurable, you should be able to put a number there. Attainable, you know, you should be able to, you know, achieve it. Attainable. I mean, you can't say, I mean, you are a new business and you want to have 1 billion revenue. No, that is not possible, isn't it? Then relevant and time-bound. Some people use the word relevant. Some, use, some textbooks will say realistic. Right, both are okay. And then time bound. It should be for a specific time period. Right? Then critical success factors. What are critical success factors? Those factors that you must do right properly so that you can achieve your mission. Okay? so that you can achieve your mission. Let's say, for example, McDonald's. McDonald's says their mission says, we want to be the number one fast food outlet in the world. That's their mission. Number one fast food outlet in the world. Right? If that is the case, what are my factors that I should achieve in order to become successful. That is critical success factors. Those factors that are critical, that are important for my success. So vital areas where things must go right for the organization in order for them to achieve their strategic objectives. Now let, let's take Sri Lanka cricket. Things must go right. What are the things? The players should perform well in batting. The bowlers should perform well in bowling. Wicket keeper, fielding. Ah, these four. Ah, those are the areas where things must go right for them. Because when they do those right, they will win matches and they become maybe number one in Asia and then number one in world. Isn't it? Right. Now, this CSF, you can classify. Monitoring crit uh, critical success factors, scrutinize current situation. Okay, see where you are. Building, okay. McDonald's says they want to become number one in the world. You can't do that immediately, no. Okay, so the next two years, we want to capture Asia. Next four years, we want to capture, let's say, Middle East. Ah, that is building. They are growing. Critical success factor, that is focus on the growth. Internal critical success factors, I mean, PSF that you said, within the organization. And, and for factors that are within manager's control, production manager will have his CSF, marketing will have his own CSF, finance, and then external. Critical success factor that relates to issues outside of, outside of manager's control. For example, material price, right? I mean, can you control? You can't, but you can negotiate, have certain measures in place like buy stock can keep, isn't it? So these are the ways you classify critical success factors. You don't have to specifically go under this classification. You can even uh, name it generally, unless otherwise they specifically say in the exam, don't go to classify. Then, sources of critical success factors. Where are these critical success factors normally come? Now, you have uh, Lux, isn't it? Who's manufacturing Lux? Quickly tell me. Who manufactures Lux? Unilever. Unilever. Do you buy Lux from Unilever? Or someone else? No, the retail right. shop. Ah, why is Unilever not selling to you directly? Tell me. 
they are doing selling B2B. Ah, that is their business model, isn't it? Are you buying Toyota from Toyota or the agent? The agent. Exactly. So if you see a lot of these big company products, we are buying from an agent. Even Unilever is a distributor model. You can call it agency also. Target, Skills, Glomark, and all the roadside shops, isn't it? So they have their agents. So for a company like Unilever, for them to become successful, the number of agents they sign up with becomes a critical success factor. That is called the industry structure, the way the industry has been formed. Now, let's say you and I get together, put money and start manufacturing a soap. We can't sell it by ourselves to the customer. We also need to move to what? An agency model. That is when we can compete with Lux, we can compete with Rexona, and we can compete with Velvet. You understand? Direct competitors. Because we need that reach. We need that, you know, uh, the, the mega reach all over the country. So industry structure, number of agents become a critical success factor, a factor that is critical for you to become successful. Did you understand that? Are you guys clear? Yes. Right, very good. Similarly, competitive strategy, right? Of leadership, differentiation, geographic location. If you want to sell sweaters, by the way, I will type in capital letters huh, so that you will know that I'm shouting at you, right? If you want to sell sweaters, where will you go and sell? Let's say you manufacture the most trendiest, stylish sweaters. Where do you go to, want to go and sell in Sri Lanka? No earlier. Exactly, no earlier. So geographic location is your critical success factor. You can sell sweaters in Kambu. Of course, you can target the foreigners, right? Now, if you see Odell and all these places have an area, right? Winter clothing. And it has a crowd, but they are targeting what? The foreigners. So geographic location, then environmental factors. You are in the airline industry, fuel cost is a major component for you. You are in the distribution industry, fuel cost is a major component for you. You are me, you are Uber, let's say, you know, if you, if you are directly involved. Then fuel is what? A major component. Temporary factors, right? I mean, there can be short-term critical success factors. And of course, functional or managerial. So this again is another way of uh, looking at it, right? But unless otherwise uh, mentioned in the exam, don't go into much of a detail. Right, then we come to the last one, performance indicators. KPIs are the measures which indicate whether or not the critical success, critical success factors are being achieved. A target will be set for each KPI. Now, I'll, I'll explain to you how these three things work in simple, okay? Now, McDonald's, right? What is the mission statement? Number one, fast food outlet in the world. I will take a little time and explain this to you properly so that you will know how Confident you should be on the gear. Okay. And what is this? This is the mission statement. The mission is number one fast food outlet in the world. And it should be smart, huh? It should be specific. Yeah, number one fast food outlet in the world. Measurable, number one. Time bound, you should put. I mean, within, I mean, by when? Another five years or 10 years or whatever. Now we come to critical success factors. Okay. Critical success factors. Normally, an organization will have 
few critical success factors, not a lot. Okay, few critical success factors. I mean, you don't need to do a thousand things to, to become number one. There are few important things that you need to do and uh, become successful. Okay. Okay, now it's very clear. Let's say you are the senior management of McDonald's and your target is becoming number one fast food outlet in the world. Now you need to decide three important things that will make you number one fast food outlet in the world. Can you tell me? Can you tell me? Success factor one. What are those things that you must achieve in order to become number one fast food outlet in the world? Gain a, a big market share on the fast food industry. Oh, very good. Market share. Market share is important. Market share is number one, isn't it? I mean, biggest market share. Another one. Lowest cost. I will park that for a while. Huh? I'll come back to it later. Anything else? Can I put quality here? Quality is important, right? You don't want to uh, bite a burger that is stale, isn't it? You want it <laughs> fresh. Yeah. McDonald's will never say healthy. Huh? They'll always say what? Fresh. <laughs> you are not healthy. <laughs> Give me another one. Hassan, uh, the point you gave me is a KPI. It's not a um, PSF. You can bring it under a heading. What is that? Another critical success factor. I already told you that when I explained Unilever. Uh, uh, the, the network, the agents. Ah, exactly. Shall we say number of outlets? Number of outlets. Right, now I'll explain to you again. If your quality is number one, and if you have the largest network of outlets, and if you have the biggest market share, then you can become number one fast food outlet in the world. Yes or no? Agreed? Yeah. Right. So we have the mission statement, and we have the critical success factors. Now third, we need to have our KPIs, <laughs> right? We need to have our key performance indicator, KPIs. Now, KPIs are those things that will tell us if we are achieving our critical success factors. KPIs are indicators, performance indicators, which will tell us if we are achieving our critical success factors. Last 10 matches, we have won two and lost eight. Can we become number one in Asia? Ah, the last 10 matches performance are the indicators. You want to go into further detail, take one match, look at each batsman's score, each bowler's performance, wicket keeper's performance. Ah, now we are going into minute details. So similarly, APIs, the achievement of both will ensure critical success factor achievement. Now, let me do one for you. Let me take the quality. How do I know whether my quality is good or bad? One KPI is customer reviews. Customer reviews, or what you call as customer satisfaction. And that will tell us whether our quality is good or bad. Number two, repeat purchase. coming by they're coming again they're coming again and again ah repeat purchase that is why you give what loyalty cards 
That is why you take the phone number. Pizza Hut, you call the first time, they'll ask you for the whole history. Name, date of birth, credit card number, address. Second time you call, they'll not ask you for anything. They'll just want, sir, what do you like to have? That's it. Of course, they'll try to upsell and cross-sell. Would you like a Coke with it and, you know, cinnamon roll and that and this. But they'll never ask you for your contact details because they already have it now. They want to know whether you are repeat purchasing. Number three, do I have quality certifications? Do I have Sri Lanka standards? Or do I have, you know, an Indian standard maybe? Do I have ISO, International Organization for Standardization? Is it it? Uh, if I have quality standards in my product, if I have the logos, uh, that means my quality is good. Uh, now I have three important KPIs which I measure on a periodic basis to ensure that my quality is good. Now, did you understand this part? Yes. So if you ensure your KPIs are achieved, uh, then you take care of your critical success factor number two. Now let's go to critical success factor number three, number of outputs, O-U-T-L-E-T-S, right? Number of outputs. Tell me one critical success factor. How do we measure if we are achieving the targets of having the highest number of outputs? Give me one indicator. Franchise agreement numbers. Ah, uh, number of agreements per month or whatever, per month, per quarter. Right. Tarakaki and another one. Number of agreements per month. How many are you adding? Should you measure how many are going out? Yeah, yeah. Ah, yes. Number of outlets shutting down. Ah, you need to measure that also. Mm. Otherwise, no point, right? Like how there's no sales in uh, certain large companies, they only put the invoice and then sales is recorded. Right? Um, <clears throat> And then money doesn't come, you know? So you must measure the shutting down also. And then look at the net. Do you, should you measure anything else? Revenue, oh, what? Revenue per? Outlet. Outlet. Profit per outlet. Ah, and only you also can take, look, no? royalty. Ah, now when you look at these KPIs, you will know whether achieving the largest number of outlets is a reality or not. Okay, then we come to market share. So in market share, you can look at revenue, uh, you, even your, your cost you can bring there. Of course, you need to couple it with profit, right? But the point is, please remember this, the point is mission critical success factor API do not exist in isolation mission will lead to right uh, mission will lead to critical success factor and based on the critical success factor you need to decide your kpis okay based on the critical success factor you need to decide your kpi these three are always together even in the exam 90 percent of the time they are always together of course there are scenarios where they will only ask you for the critical success factor or only ask you for the kpi but most of the time it's always together now how do they test it in the exam right um they'll give you a mission statement initially then they'll give you another mission statement right at the end of the question. Then they'll ask you, can you tell us some KPIs for the change in the mission statement? So then you should only consider the change in the mission statement. Later I'll do a question, you know, 
of, of that sort, then you will understand. Mm -hmm. Right? So remember, these three are always together. Now I'm going to do a small question on this to make you understand how uh, critical or complex a question from this area can be. Now, now, this level of knowledge is more than enough to do that question, right? We don't need to uh, read paragraphs and paragraphs. Let me share the question with you. I just shared the question on your WhatsApp group. You can uh, download it and start reading it. I'll also put it on the screen. Can you please uh, read this? Slowly read it, try to understand every point. And if there are any areas that you don't understand, please drop me a message.
Right. Are you guys uh, done reading the question? Have you gone through the question fully? Yes. Right. Um, now look at the first part. Using only the above information, show how the FD of HSE reached its conclusion regarding the expected sales margin. So that is one part, isn't it? And then you have this end. Wherever you have an end, before is one question, after is another question. Okay. Also, state whether he was correct to be concerned about an increase in the price of ingredients. Right? State whether he was correct to be concerned about an increase in the price ingredient. Now, this is how APM questions are. Now, they won't exactly tell you what exactly you need to do to get the answer that you should know. But it's a little clear, I mean, with the numbers that are given that you are supposed to do some calculation. But what type of a calculation that we need to figure out, isn't it? So number one, now directly says, uh, and number eight, huh? the FD has stated that he believed the target sales margin of 32% can, can be achieved. Now what is sales margin, the equation? Sales margin is either profit or margin divided by sales into 100%. So we need uh, we need to know the profit, we need to know the sales, right? So that's why they have given you so many numbers here. And then we have to see what we calculate is uh, closer to 32%. And then we also need to say whether he was correct to be concerned about an increase in the price of ingredients. Now, what is he saying? Uh, although he's concerned, right? Although he's concerned about the effect that an increase in the cost of all ingredients would have on the forecasted profits, assuming that all other revenue cost data remains unchanged. So only change he's looking at is ingredients. He's expecting everything else to remain constant and any change in ingredients cost is going to worry him. So the question is, is he correct to be worried? So we need to do something small there to understand, to identify, to tell, okay, he's right or wrong. Now, very clearly they said five marks. For a five mark question, how much of time do you have to answer? Tell me that. For a five mark question, how much of time do you have? About nine minutes. Exactly. Five into 1.8, 1.8 at the top level. Huh? 1.8 is nine minutes. Now I'm going to give you nine minutes exactly, starting from now. And then let's see what you're producing. Start now. If you can do something within the nine minutes. Start now.
Do you guys have an answer? I've given you exactly nine minutes. Actually, I've given you one more minute. Do you have an answer here for the report? Anyone, have you done anything? So as per the calculation, I don't know whether it's correct. Uh, there's a buffer, so I think he need not to worry much about it. But uh, what is the margin you got? That's, uh, the, now the target margin is 32, right? So yeah. that's, the, that's the minimum, which is 32% of 2.4 on the selling price. Mm -hmm. Per sandwich. Are you getting two point four? Uh, you okay. have to work out the individual per per sandwich cost with all the details. And now, in this question, you need to first of all understand the structure of the organization. Now, you're not getting two point four. Okay, listen to this. Mm. Directors of uh, HCG, Commons 98, have decided to enter the sandwich market. It has set up a separate operation under the name of HCG. Okay, so HCG is the parent company. They have put up a subsidiary called HCG, the sandwiches company. The management team for HCG has been recruited by, okay. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Now look at this, sir. Huh? HSC, let's say we all are working for HSC. They agreed to make and supply sandwiches to agreed recipes for SFG. So we, let's say we are fab. We are making sandwiches to caravan, SFG which owns a chain of supermarkets. Caravan owns a chain of supermarkets. We, HSC, we are not selling to individual customers. We are selling only to Caravan, B2B. Caravan will sell it to anyone, uh, which owns a chain of supermarkets in all town, right? Um, except the instance that it selects the supplies, yeah, all that is fine, right? And HSC, we, will be the sole supplier of SFG. We are the only ones who supply to Caravan. And Caravan will sell all those sandwiches to individual customers. Right? But we need to understand the business model. Number of sandwiches sold per year is 625. Caravan, no? not us. Caravan has a market share of 4%. So 625 into 4%, that is 25 million sandwiches. That is the number of sandwich caravan will sell to, uh, you know, the sandwich purchasers, right? Customers. The average selling price of all sandwiches sold by SFG, all sandwiches sold by caravan is 2.4. Caravan will get 2.4. And caravan wishes to make a markup of 33 one third. Okay. Caravan wishes to make a markup of 33 one third, and their selling price is 2.4. Now tell me what is our revenue? What is our sales? We are selling to Caravan. Caravan is selling to customers for 2.4, and Caravan wants to make 33 one third. Yeah. Then what is After. our revenue? The, the the 77 percentage the cost caravan is getting 67%. from us 67 percent 67 sorry ah uh, now tell me for the total market share what is that revenue uh, do you get that question sir what is the revenue if that is the case for the total market share what is the revenue into 25 million. Yeah, give me the figure.
4200 million. A common one way. How do you take that? <clears throat> Thirty-three one third. Thirty-three. Okay, let me look at it, do it like this. One divided by three. Point three 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 kilo, yeah, isn't it? So what is the revenue here? This is number of customers. Anyone with the revenue? So you 40, have 33%? Here, 40,000. Okay, again. This is your 33, this is your one, isn't it? Yeah. The... So, yeah. So then two -thirds you know, the... together is this 33.333 divided by 100. Right? So now sales into 2.4 divided by. Sorry, one divided by three, yeah. So it will be like, you know, plus one. One plus this. It could be J six. So into two point four divided by one point three three. Forty-five thousand. I wanted to get it to the you know proper decimals. Anyway, so your revenue is the more these you put, it will be you know forty-five thousand. Exactly, that's your revenue. Total number of customers is twenty-five million into 2.4 is the revenue that uh, Kevin or SFG makes. Of that, our percentage is 1.3. Basically, you know, the 60, 6.67%. Uh, 
basically their cost is our revenue okay their cost is our revenue <clears throat> Now you have the balance items. Ingredients. Now quickly put those figures. Ingredients. Then you have uh, packaging and labeling. Then you have fixed overheads. Then you have uh, distribution. And then you will have profit. Fixed overhead is easy, isn't it? They have given us 5401. Distribution, they say 8% of revenue minus. 0 0.08 into revenue, 3,600. Ingredients, final director, it is estimated that an average cost of ingredients per sandwich is 0 0.7. into point seven. Packaging and label, 0.15%. So that's your profit, 17.079. Profit margin, Profit percentage, profit divided by revenue. Thirty two point seven eight percent. Now we just did the calculation for the first part. Right? We just did the calculation for the first part. Using only the above information, so how the Finance director reached his conclusion regarding the expected sales margin. Uh, so this is how he has arrived at 32.78%. So that's what we just showed. Are you guys clear with this now? Yes. Right, good. Now we are going to the second part. State whether he was correct to be concerned about an increase in the price of ingredients. Is he right to be worried about an increase in the ingredient price? So this is where our target is now. Okay. Now, he is worried if the ingredient price increases, he will not be able to achieve the target profit. Now, what is the target profit? Our profit percentage is 32. 32%. Right? Therefore, target profit at 32% is 45 into 0.32. Okay. 14,400. Target profit percentage according to him is 32 percent, right? And at the target profit of 32 percent, the profit absolute value is 14,400. There is one more calculation to be done, but I will give you a chance. Can you tell me, is he correct to be worried? Is this worry real? What do you think? Yeah, or, why, why do you say that? I need one more calculation to prove that. 
uh, we can uh, take the difference 14,400 and 14,749, the percentage and how much ingredient can go up. As exactly. Well. Exactly. Right. So that is 14,749 minus 14,400 is 379. Three hundred forty nine. So three forty nine divided by fourteen four hundred. So that's a very very minute percentage. Or we take it from uh, fourteen seven four nine. No, that is in uh, the one. Yeah. I want to Now see, difference between 14,749 and 14,400 is only 349,000, 349. Currently your ingredient price is 17,500, 17,500. So 349 divided by 17,500, of your total cost of 17,500, 349 is only a 1.99% increase. Okay, let's say 2%. Only a 2% increase. Now he is worried if the ingredient cost increases, the margins will drop. Let's say the increase of ingredient cost is 2.5%. Can he achieve the target profit of 32%? No. If Ah, exactly. No, isn't it? If the ingredient cost increases more than 1.99, every percentage increase will reduce its margin. Therefore, the question is about sensitivity. Sensitivity. Is it correct to be concerned about an increase in the ingredient price that will have uh, the impact that will have on the profit margin? Yes, he is right. Because a 1.99% increase is highly possible. It's highly sensitive. It's a very minor increase. If it's a major increase, you don't have to worry because normally prices don't increase by a massive percentage. Unless, of course, if it is Sri Lanka, you know, where overnight carrot price goes up by 2,000, right? But a minor percentage, like 1.99, is highly possible. So he is right. So there you need to explain and write a conclusion. Okay. Can I uh, quickly read that for you to write it down? So you say, director's target profit is 32%. Director's target profit is 32%. At which they expect to make a profit of 14,400. At which they expect to make a profit of 14,400. Our calculations show that, our calculations show that a slight increase in profit percentage could be expected. A slight increase in profit percentage could be expected. With 32.78%, with 32.78%, with an absolute profit value of 14,749, with an absolute profit value of 14,749. The difference being, 
the difference being 349,000. The difference being 349,000. If we consider, if we consider this increase as an impact on ingredient price, as an impact on the ingredient price or the ingredient cost, it's only a 1.99%, it's only a 1.99% increase which says that which says that the director is correct to be concerned the director is correct to be concerned about an increase in the ingredient price about an increase in the ingredient price as the chance of this increase as the chance of this increase as the chance of this increase is quite high is quite high in brackets you can say high sensitivity Are you guys clear? Right. Now I'm going to teach you something very important. Okay. And I want all three of you to answer. Now we have three figures with decimals. Now this was two, but I made it to two decimals. Right? Now let's say let's say this is what you have done. You have shown the profit here as 32.8 percent. Here, target profit you have shown as 32.00 percent, and you have shown the uh, ingredients uh, increase at a two percent. Now, my question, which I want all three of you to answer, will you get marks for these three figures? Will you get marks? Ganesh and Naomi, will you get uh, marks? I think no. Why Ganesh? Because they might look at the process of where you are arriving at how, not the final answer. No, you have shown the process, no? You have shown all the figures. Okay. I so think I weightage, is, by, yeah. Yeah, tell me, go ahead. Weightage wise could be less than. What I'm asking is if you show these three figures like how I have shown it here, will you get marked? So you won't because um, there is no consistency? Yeah, exactly. Remember this, uh, a, lot, a lot of students don't know this. If you show one figure for two decimals, make sure you show all the figures for two decimals. 
This is what you call consistency. And you need to maintain consistency within a question, not among all questions. Now, let's say there are three calculations in three parts. No. One can go for three decimals. One you can round off. Another one can go for two. So within these questions, your decimal should have consistent. Okay. Don't forget that. There are a lot of things in APM. So as we go on, I'll teach you that. So make a note of that. Now, Ganeshan, are you clear? Yes, sir. Right, good. And we hope you, you also clear. Right. Now, see, a question like this, guys, I mean, you need to think five marks, nine minutes. We have to be super speed and super smart in the sense, you know, tuck, tuck, gala, we have to figure out, right, what to do. Because only nine minutes, no. How much can we do within nine minutes? By the time you read up and down, two, three minutes have gone. But it's a very simple one. Now, when, when we do it, you see, okay, this is all they need. So in APM, you must do a lot of questions to get the hang of it. Right, your examiner's style of question to get the hang of that. So if you do about, I don't know, maybe 100 questions, you know, or at least 50, uh, then you know, okay, this is how he is testing us. Then let me move to the second one, where we learned the theory today. Explain five critical success factors to the performance of HC on which the directors must focus if it is to achieve success in its marketplace. So very simple question, right? Five critical success factors um, they should focus on if they are to achieve success. So one, two, three, four, five. So can you tell me how these 10 marks are given? How do we write for the 10 marks? Can you quickly tell me? Anyone who wants to give it a try, you should know in the exam. He is asking for five critical success factors, but he is giving 10 marks. How do I get the 10 marks? By writing five critical success factors. Give it a try. You might be wrong. That's okay. Ganesh, you want to go? You want to go ahead and tell I me? I think uh, they wanted to explain a bit how we pick that as a critical success factor and for the for the measurement of the performance. So for one, you get two marks, is it? For one point each for 10, 10 CSF, it's too much. <laughs> But they want you only five, no? Yeah, so they ask five. We have to elaborate a bit each point, each success factor, how it's linked to the objective of the company, how how we select it. Uh, Hassan? Yeah, yes, sir. Like what he said, like for each point, there will be two marks. One is to describe the CSF and how you link it to the company. Right. Yeah, very good. So one is what CSF. Second, how it links. Or explanation of the CSF. Very simple. You don't have to write paragraphs and paragraphs. Example, I'll, I'll give you one. Na? Now you see in the scenario. Um, yeah, let me show this to you. Look at this point number three. Ninety percent of all sandwiches sold by SFG are sold before two p.m. each day. So if you go and deliver it in the morning, ninety percent gets sold before two p.m. Majority of the remaining ten percent are sold. After 8 p.m. 
So they're selling the whole hundred percent. But then ninety percent of your revenue for those sandwiches comes before two p.m. Tell me a critical success factor for this. Should they monitor this? Yes. What kind of critical success factor is important there? time delivery because if you delay delivery let's say you go and deliver at 1 pm ah uh, then problem because between 1 to 2 they have only one now they won't be able to sell the 90 percent okay on time delivery then you can plain and write here because 90 percent of the sandwiches are sold before 2 pm right any any delay for half an hour one hour will impact that 90 percent Right? And in case if you uh, can't sell, after 8 p.m. also, you won't be able to sell the 100%. So if you don't sell 100%, sandwiches will be what? Wasted. And how will it impact your performance? Sometimes, you know, later, that guy might say, if you delay, you, you bear up the cost. Isn't it? Because your performance is their performance. If you delay, their sales is getting affected. If their sales is getting affected, it's a cost for them. They might pass it on to you. Maybe they'll come up with a penalty or a fine. Understand? You don't have to write paragraphs and paragraphs. Two, three lines is more than enough. So on-time delivery is a critical factor for RAS. Okay. Normally, on-time delivery is a KPI. But in this case, it is an important you know, element for us to become successful, critical success factor. Give me another four. Yeah, the cost, cost of ingredient. Again? Cost of ingredient. Cost of ingredient. Okay, yeah, so your profit margin, isn't it? Cost. Yeah, very good. Cost of ingredients. Where else? Another three. And if you keep your cost low, your margins can be better. So that's what you will explain. Another one. Quality certifications. Quality certifications like ISO, like I told you before. If they are there, then that means your product quality is good. Isn't it? More and more customers will come and buy from you. Right? More and more customers. Now, now, your HSC, SFG is buying from you. So like that, you can find more customers if your quality is good. You have the final product. Then another critical success factor, technical quality. The way you prepare your mixtures, you know, um, the staff that you have in place, technical quality. And finally, new product development. I mean, um, okay, in Sri Lanka, you don't find many, but if you go to foreign countries, you go to a sandwich, uh, you know, a coffee shop or whatever, you have many varieties, isn't it? Right, so you give more choice to the customer, new product development. Uh, then that will also work uh, in your favor to become more successful in the marketplace. Right, now see, the point that I want to make is, in theory, we learned mission, critical success factor, KPI. But in the exam, he's asking about a sandwich business. Understand, similarly, you might talk about an airline or a hospital, right? Or a school. Understand? Or a company that is engaged in cleaning. And now, accordingly, we should be able to give critical success factors and KPIs. So that is where you need to have a little bit of business knowledge, uh, industry awareness. Now, if you take airline, Safety is a top priority. 
if you take a hospital, qualified doctors or surgical quality or successful uh, surgeries are top priorities. If you take a school, qualified teachers, students to teacher ratio, facilities or students experience are critical success factors. Isn't it? Take cleaning, hygiene becomes a critical success factor. Frequency of cleaning, KPI. So local knowledge is very important. Now, are you guys clear here with how I taught you the theory and this question? Did it make uh, sense to you? Are you guys okay, comfortable? Yes, sir. All right, good. Thanks. Okay, let's take a small break and come back and I'll do another small theory and explain another question to you. I take about 15 minutes and come back.
Hi guys, uh, welcome back. Are you guys there? Right. Okay, uh, so few areas from uh, chapter one, which I would like to quickly take you through. By the way, have you guys done SBL? Did you guys uh, do SBL? Okay, Hassan has done. Naomi, have you done SBL? Because if you have done SBL, Professional skills is not a major deal, you know. But anyway, don't worry. <laughs> right, then you got uh, benchmarking. Uh, all these theories I will be taking you through quickly where I feel uh, you. I need to explain more for you to be better prepared, then I will take a bit more time, okay? So benchmarking is basically uh, comparing performance in order to improve performance. Uh, this is important, no? Seven stages. Determine areas to benchmark and identify the KPIs. Select partner. Whom are you going to compare yourself with? It can be internal, internal company or competitor, right? Then measure performance of partners using the KPIs chosen. Then measure own performance, our performance. And look at the gap. We are doing 10, they are doing 15. So 15 is better, isn't it? So that's five is the gap. Decide on action to close the gap. Implement and monitor actions. And then you, you know, continuously do it because there's no end to growth, development, improvement, right? But the seven steps are important. Now just read this up. Huh? Some people say, no, theory is not important. Just read this part, what you see on the screen. Now it says, an APM question requirement is unlikely to ask you to list or explain the entire process. So they will rarely tell you to put down the seven steps. However, knowledge of the steps is required. This is what I'm also saying. You may be asked to complete a benchmarking exercise that has already been started or to carry out a particular step or to comment on the results of benchmarking exercise that has been completed. To do all that, you need to know the steps. Without knowing the steps, you can't do that. So should you know the steps? Yes. All steps, you should know black and white what they are. Same thing with any theory. Yeah? Um, go through the advantages and disadvantages. This is also important, right? In, uh, types of the benchmarks. So then we have uh, certain other models that we need to learn. SWOT basically looks at strength, weakness, opportunities, and threats. Just political, economic, social, and technological. There, you will be asked to uh, do, you know, like a environmental analysis. Then Porter's five forces. Now here, guys, um, there are two types of environment: macro and micro. Micro means close. 
So micro, we will use strength and weakness and portus fibrosis. These two are micro, near environment. Then opportunities and threats and pest, right? That we will use for the macro environmental elements. That's how this is used. We got uh, BCG, Boston Consultancy Group Matrix, which looks at, uh, you know, portfolio of products, right, with uh, market share and market growth. You need to know, uh, basically, you know, there are, what are the, okay, now we have four, no? star, cash cow, question mark or problem child. dog. I mean, what do we do to products which are stars? What do we do? Well, this is what you need to know for the exam. First, you need to know how to identify the star. Then you need to know what to do with it. Right. Star you invest. Good. You have to constantly put a lot of money to keep it at that position. Cash cow. A star product is where you, the market is growing and your market share is also good. Cash cow. What do you do? Cash cow. There's another word, Naomi. Hold. What's the other one? Oh, very good. Don't invest because the cow is going to die now. Old. Market has matured. You're not getting any more new customers. So no point um, investing in innovation, advertisements, research and development because the market is saturated. Demand for landline telephone is done. Nobody's going to buy. So just if you have connections, get the maximum out of it. Reduce your cost and get the maximum out of it. That is what harvest is. And you will need that money for the stock. Then question mark, what do we do? Market is growing, but our growth is low. Right? What do we do here? Invest, yes, invest. Or we call it build. That's the correct word, build. Ten mark is high market growth, low market share. So we need to find out the reason as to why the market share is low. And then build. Dog. Low market share, low market growth, dog. What do we do? Correct. Kill the dog. All right? Dive it. Don't waste your time there. Shut down the operation. Take the money. Put it somewhere else. Either put it to star or question mark. So this is a model that helps you to do portfolio analysis based on two key criteria, market growth and market share. And then lets you decide what to do with regards to each type of product you have. Right? So like that, you need to be really clear about the concept. Okay. Then you have Ansoff matrix, which talks about... Uh, product growth and, you know, market growth, right? So uh, basically, let me quickly draw it for you. You have your 
customers and products. So existing customers and new customers and existing products and new products. If you want to increase the sales here with regards to existing products and existing customers, what do you do? What's the solution? You have a customer base and you are selling to that customer base currently, but you want more revenue from these customers from the products that you are selling. How can we increase? What do you do? Exactly, you penetrate the market. Penetration means reducing the selling price. So you can't just say, uh, you know, so you need to explain in the exam. Penetration means reducing the selling price. Buy one, get two, 50% off, isn't it? Or 30% discount, right? Promotions, basically. Then, um, existing products, you want to sell it to the new customers. We call it market development. Right, your existing products, you go and, you know, let's say you're selling only in Colombo. Now you go, go and sell it in Candy. So that is market development. Or to your existing customers, you sell a new product. That is product development. To your existing customers, you sell a new product. Now, between these two, which is easy or which is more riskier? Uh, that's the that's better way to look at it. Which is more riskier? Which is more difficult? Between market development and product development. Market development. Why, Ganesh? Why is market development difficult? Uh, um, uh, product development might be a thing that in our control than the market development, as I think. Yeah, basically, it's the customers. It is easy to sell something new for your existing customer because you have built a relation, isn't it? You already know them. If you tell them, they will accept. But it is very difficult to sell something to a new customer. So that is where market development becomes more riskier, right? Investment is more. Whereas in product development, the investment is not high. They already, you already have the base, right? So it's a matter of telling them that it is there. And the last one, where you sell a new product to a new customer segment is called as diversification. Now diversification is of two types. Related diversification, unrelated diversification. Related diversification is where, let's say, PPIM now wants to start uh, producing books. They want to distribute books. Now then that is related. Pretty much in the same line of education, value chain, same line. Unrelated diversification, PPIM wants to start a hospital. Education, hospital, totally something. New. So that is unrelated diversification. So if you look at all four, diversification is the most riskier. And in that, unrelated becomes even more riskier. Right? This is unsolved. And then you have a generic strategy. Tell me the generic strategy, the names. What are the three generic strategies? Cost leadership. What's the other one? A 
soft leadership, differentiation. Focus, right? Right, focus. It's basically uh, your competitive advantage and your scope. You can be a first leader, a differentiator to the broad market. Or you can have a focus strategy. <clears throat> Either a focus cost leader or a focus differentiator. And it's very simple. What it says, if you be the lowest cost manufacturer, if you be the lowest cost manufacturer in the industry, then you have an advantage over the others where you can charge the lowest selling price. Let's say we both are selling pencils. My cost is five, your cost is seven per pencil. I can even sell at six to make a margin, but you can't because your cost is that is what? So having being a low cost producer, lowest cost producer gives you an advantage. Or you get a differentiator. Meaning you sell a product that is different to the customer and the difference will help you to charge a premium price, premium price. Now we buy ice cream from Goldfins, but you go to uh, Baskin Robbins, it's easily about 300, 400 a cone, isn't it? Why Baskin Robbins give you quality, air condition, hygiene, waffle cone, Toppings, isn't it? Oh, no, they are giving you a different experience. Uh, for that process, you can charge a premium. So these are the two variables on which you can compete in the market. And uh, you can either focus the entire market all over Sri Lanka, then he calls it broad cost leadership or broad differentiation. Or if you sell only in Colombo, he calls it focused niche marketing, niche marketing. We are manufacturing t-shirts to all sports players. Then that is broad. We are manufacturing t-shirts only to football players. That is focus, niche. Right? Uh, now let me give you some products. Harley Davidson. Where will you put it? Harley Davidson. Where does it fall? Very good. Differentiation focus. Correct. Uh, Toyota, Honda, Nissan. Where do we put those? Toyota, Nissan, Honda falls under cost leadership. Huh? Mercedes, BMW falls under differentiation. Okay. Ferrari. Ferrari falls where? Focus differentiator. Loving, expensive. Not everyone. Knows. So focused differentiator. Uh, then finally, balance core card. Right. So it's basically model that tells you. When it comes to evaluating or assessing or measuring performance, you not only need to look at your financial performance, but you also need to look at non-financials. I'll come to the 
I mean, I'll show you how you come to that uh, basis. You have X and Y, right? X is independent, Y is dependent. Profit is X or Y, profit. Profit is X or Y. Exactly. Profit is dependent. Then, but if you look at companies and profit is dependent, dependent is, I mean, profit is financial, isn't it? There is so much of focus on the financial performance. Sales is dependent. Cost is dependent. Profit is dependent. Your entire p &L is dependent. But there is excessive focus there. You look at the profit and you start scolding everyone. We don't have enough profit. You look at the cost and again you scold everyone. Cost is too much. Kaplan and Norton, the guys who introduced the balance scorecard said, you need to look at what is driving this. Independent factors. If you advertise, you will get sales. If you advertise, you will get sales. So advertisement decision is independent. Sales is dependent on that. Financials, yes, you need to measure. But Kaplan and Norton are saying, you also need to measure a few other things. What are those? Check how your customers are feeling. <clears throat> because if they are not happy, your business is not going to do good. So you need to measure customer perspective, customer satisfaction, repeat purchase, warranty claims, returns. Then you also check earning and growth perspective. What is your investment on research and development? How many new products are you introducing? How many of those products are becoming successful? Learning and growth. How are your staff learning and growing? Do you have knowledge management within your organization? measure KPIs, then you also need to look at internal business processes perspective. Your business processes are activities that deliver value, products and services to customers. How are you doing those? Do you have productivity? What is your input output ratio? Can you reduce your wastage? What is your lead time? What is your cycle time? Right? Uh, all that will tell you how your IBP is performing. Now, when you look at all four, you have a balanced view for your performance evaluation. You have a balanced view for your performance evaluation. Rather than only looking at financials, you also need to look at all other three. And we also call it a model for strategy mapping. Oh. You want your financials to be X amount. Let's say return on investment, you want 15%. To get 15%, to get the 15%, what is the next one? <clears throat> to get the 15%, what do I do? Any idea? How much do I make from my customer? Do I keep my customers happy? Because my customers give my finances. To get from my customers, what are the internal business processes I need to improve? And for these processes, how do I learn? and growth. So learning and growth will improve your business process. Business process will keep customers happy. Customers will give you the financials. 
which will eventually keep your shareholders happy. This is what you call strategy mapping, balance core card. So each of these models, guys, you need to have conceptual clarity, you know, proper clarity on the models. What it is, when do we use it? What are the advantages and disadvantages? Right, now I'm going to give you, I'm going to explain this five forces and give you a question. And I want you to write, keep an answer and share with me on the group. I will do a marking and give it back to you. Right? Okay, what is five forces? When do we use five forces? When do we use five forces? Something called as industries. To understand the competitive nature of the company, nature of the industry. Yeah, okay. There's something called as industries. An industry is a section of companies doing similar business. Dialogue, Mobitel, Retisala, Cattel, Hut, Mobile Industry. No one else is there, only this. So, all five together have total market size. Each one, a, all, each one owns a particular market share. And they compete. So, when you look at five forces, you can understand something. I'll come to that. Then you have food industry. Education industry, travel and tourism industry, IT industry, um, there are so many. And within this, there are subcategories also. If you take food, then you have fast food, junk food, uh, you know, the pilaus, the McDonald's category, right? You know, then fine dining. So, so many categories, so many industries. Now, what says? If you want to invest in an industry, the single most driving factor is return on investment. You have 10 million. You want to decide where to put that money. You will put it into a business where you can get the maximum ROI. Simple as that. If that is the case, how do I identify which industry gives me the highest ROI? How do I identify which industry gives me the highest ROI? If there are so many industries, and that's what Porter calls as industry attractiveness. Industry attractiveness. By attractiveness, he means ability to make profit, profitability. Ability to make profit. So an industry is attractive when you can make money from that industry. How do you identify whether you can make money or not? Is by looking at the five forces. Is by looking at the five forces. Right? So look at this. Porter says bargaining power of bias bargaining power. Bargaining power of customers. I'll explain one now. Customer has bargaining power. That means he will tell you to reduce the price. If you reduce the price, your margin will drop. Then we need to look at what are the factors that will make customer have power or the company have power. If the company has power, margin is protected. If the customer has power, margin has an issue. You go to McDonald's, you ask for the price of a meal, they say 2,500. Now you tell, can you please charge 2,000? They will say, thank you very much, we can't. Why? Because they have so many customers. So if the company has bargaining power, margin is protected. If the customer has bargaining power, it's not. So large number of customers, right, will say company has power. Few number of customers, customer has power. So there are factors that decides whether customer has power or company has power. 
Similarly, platform potential entrance, platform new entrance will depend on barriers to entry. Now, mobile industry in Sri Lanka, you guys, I mean, you guys, let's say, collect money and put a 10 billion investment. Now, you want to start another telecom company. Can you start? Government won't allow because, you know, the legal barrier. You might not have uh, the technological know-how. You all are accountant. So barrier, right? Uh, then margins are not enough. Your ROI, you know, it's going to take a long time. Uh, again, barrier. So threat of new entrants will depend on barriers to entry. So like that, I know you know this, right? So uh, like that, you need to look at the five forces to understand whether an industry is attractive or not. Now tell me, if the strength of the forces are strong, profitability is high or low. If the strength of the forces are strong, profitability is high or low. Strength of the forces are strong, meaning bargaining power of customer is high, threat of new entrant is high, threat of substitute is high, competitive rivalry is high, supply bargaining power is also high. Ah, exactly. So all three of you understand that. So that's really good. So if the strength of the forces are strong, profitability is low. If the strength of the forces are weak, then profitability is high. So you enter an industry where the strength of the five forces are weak. That's the conclusion. All right. Now, it also says one more thing. Normally, an industry's profitability decided by this. But sometimes there are other factors which will also give better margins. During COVID, tell me two businesses which did really well. Because of COVID, these two businesses shot up like overnight. What are those? Exactly. E-commerce was the other one. Delivery, Uber, correct. Another one? The obvious one? No, oh, pharmaceutical, exactly. So very good. Now all three of you gave me three super answers. Very good. Now Porter says, those are the factors. Once the COVID settles, ah, now we are going back to class. Need for medicine is less. Need for Uber is less. So don't fall for temporary factors just because now, now, Look at Uber and don't go and start a delivery company because that is temporary. So you must always focus on the permanent part of the industry, which are five forces, not the temporary factors. Further, so like this, you must have very good clarity on the theory. Okay. Um, by the way, do you have this uh, note that I'm using? Do you want it? I'll, I'll share it on the group. It's very easy to uh, revise through this. It's not detailed, but uh, still it's good. I'll, I'll share it. Okay, so what I'll do is... Uh, yes, I will. I will. Um, I will share a question on your group, WhatsApp group. It's about five forces. Please take time and type a nice answer and send it to me. I will mark it and give you my feedback. And we'll try to do a few questions like that because that's the only way uh, where you can face the exam, right? It's not just me telling you what to do and you go and do the exam. Without me seeing what you are doing, it's very difficult for me to uh, tell you where you need to improve, right? So let's try to do as uh, many as possible with the time you know that we have. And you guys need to, you know, actually get down and do it, right? You can type it in a Word document and you know put your name and send it to me on WhatsApp, all right? And also, if there are any areas that you want me to particularly focus more, please drop a message on WhatsApp, right? So rather than shooting in 
all direction within this limited time, I also can be more focused on what you need. All good, any questions? Okay, guys. So thank you for joining and I'll catch up with you next Monday. Take care and have a rest of, you know, I mean, good week and good night. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye.